Greetings. My name is Dr. Waddell Brooks, Sr., your host, and this is Community Focus. Ladies and gentlemen, we have an outstanding person with us uh, this morning. It's a person that you should know uh, by the uh, name of Colonel Roy Merrill. Uh, he's a uh, retired uh, uh, Air Force colonel. Good morning, uh, Colonel Merrill. Good morning. How you doing, sir? We're very happy that you've taken time from your busy schedule, literally from your busy schedule, to be with us on Community Focus to talk to Lake County about your career. Uh, Community Focus is a career uh, program. It's, uh, we look all over the county uh, to get outstanding people to come uh, uh, to talk with us. And But I don't know how many people are up 5 o'clock this Sunday morning uh, listen to the program, but we do have a pretty good audience. In other words, I feel that uh, you're going to cause my ratings to go up. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but tell, tell our listening audience um, a little bit about your personal and professional background. Uh, Roy Merrill uh, hails from uh, Gulfport, Mississippi. Uh, went to high school there, graduated from Gulfport East High School. And uh, upon graduation, uh, taking the summer off, I enlisted in the U.S. Navy. And I stayed in the Navy about uh, almost two years, 18 months to be exact, because I was um, allowed to uh, go back to school early. So uh, they released me about six months early to go back to school. So that's, that's a little bit about me and, and where I, I hail from. Well, just a little bit about the, your family background in Gulfport, Mississippi. Now, I know of Gulfport is right near the the border, right sitting on the border, right? It is. It's, yeah. it's next to the water. It is the water. Yeah. And also there was, uh, what, a, a storm? Right. That, uh, uh, maybe a couple, but the last yes. one was really devastating. Katrina. And Katrina, okay. And uh, it's near Past Christian. I know Past Christian because one of the uh, Robin Roberts. Robin Roberts, uh, t- a TV anchor, is from Past Christian, and that's when everybody found out about Past Christian. But tell us about the uniqueness of, of Gulfport. Well, uh, Gulfport is uh, right next to Biloxi, I guess. The, the biggest thing that you know, or I guess what really put Gulfport on the map along with Biloxi was two major storms, uh, the first being Camille in 1969 Mm -hmm. and the second in 2005 being Katrina. And um, the coast, for the most part, uh, all along the coast, because Gulfport and Biloxi sits right between uh, New Orleans, Louisiana, and Mobile, Alabama. And, uh, you know, if I think about it, uh, which one was worse? It was probably Camille because there was probably more major damage uh, mm. during that storm in 1969 than it was in 2005. 2005 probably saw a lot more flooding than uh, 1969, but they were both devastating. And both areas have come back, and uh, now— uh, one better than the other one being Biloxi is better known because it it's uh, one of the biggest casino places along the coast uh, next to Las Vegas, if you think about it that way. Wow, wow. Um, yeah, I was going to ask you about the changes that have been made since you left. Oh, uh, the changes, it's, it's built up a lot. Gulfport has probably expanded uh, by leaps and bounds, uh, probably more so than... Uh, Biloxi because it had more room to expand going north. And uh, the population is probably, uh, I would say, in the neighborhood of maybe 150, 200,000. And that's big for the coast. Mm -hmm. But um, and it also has the uh, naval base in Gulfport. And uh, in Biloxi, they have the Air Force Base, which is Keesler Air Force Mm -hmm. Base. Okay, B, uh, before we leave uh, uh, Gulfport and get into your military career, tell us about the uniqueness of your family. Okay. Uh, 
family of 14, and uh, we're not Catholic, by the way. <laughs> we are Baptists, believe it or not. Not yeah. Southern Baptists, but we are National Baptists. Okay. Um, my father was Willie Merrill, and my mother was Willie May Merrill. And uh, she raised 14 uh, children, kids, however you want to call it. And uh, after doing that, uh, I guess before my senior year in high school, my mother went back to school and graduated the same time I was graduating from high school, which was a big accomplishment for her and for our family because that was something she always wanted to do. And they all, well, both my parents, they impressed upon us the importance of going to school. So out of 14, um, 13 of us uh, did go to college. Uh, 12 of us have uh, degrees ranging from uh, bachelor's all the way to doctorate. So, yeah, quite a few. Seven other brothers and uh, five sisters, six sisters, I'm sorry. Ladies and gentlemen, again, we're talking with Colonel Roy A. uh, Merrill, um, a retired Air Force colonel, Matter of fact, he was a senior communications officer uh, when he retired. Uh, but Colonel Merrill, uh, what piqued your interest uh, in the military? <laughs> well, having uh, already enlisted in the U.S. Navy, I, I knew about the Navy, uh, and uh, I knew I didn't want to go back to the Navy after going back to school. So uh, I decided to... Um, I guess enrolled in uh, Air Force ROTC, Mm -hmm. and uh, I got a commission, and uh, I was commissioned in 1977 from the University of Southern Mississippi, where I got my bachelor's degree, and hence that started my Air Force career. Needless to say, uh, at that time, I had no idea or no plans to stay as long as I stayed, but... uh, I guess I could say one thing. Uh, I, I stayed because I enjoyed what I was doing over 33 years because that's what it ended up being when I retired. If a youngster, um, senior in high school, um, uh, want to choose uh, Air Force uh, as a career, what are some of the characteristics that uh, they should have, male or female, you know, because uh, uh, females, uh, more females are going into military now than before, especially Navy and Air Force. What characteristics would they need to have? Uh, Characteristic-wise, uh, they all have to have a high school diploma. That's probably one of the key things that you need now, Uh not necessarily the Air Force, but any of the military services, they can be a lot more selective. And they at least want you to have a high school diploma because uh, in order for you to be trained to go in certain career fields, depending on where you're tested and where your test scores come, it pretty much tells them this is where your interests lie. And uh, it pretty much dictates, you know, uh, this is the career field for you. So, Uh, depending on what what those scores are, uh, a lot of them, uh, I'm not going to say a lot, but uh, for the most part with the Air Force, since our primary mission is to fly and fight, um, they have to want (laughs) to either fly or, uh, you know, support the Air Force or support our mission in anything we do because we're all over the world. Well, actually, in... In Navy, it's a, it's swimming. You have to know how to swim. <laughs> in the Air Force, you have to be willing to fly. Right? Fly well, not you. You can be on the ground most of the time because everybody don't fly planes. That's the other thing. Because in order for those planes to fly, you have to have mechanics that are uh, uh, technical in a sense that know what they're doing and know how to fix the planes. Because everything now is just. Uh, it's, it's to the extreme in terms of how far our technology has driven things. And, uh, you know, with advanced fighters and transport planes, uh, you have to be able to know how to, to fix them. And they, they pretty much know because, like I say, the training they get 
uh, is not something, you know, you can go do in a month or two. Uh, we're talking years, mm. you know, for them to become proficient in their train as they go up, the further up they go. Mm-hmm. Uh, Colonel Merrill, you mentioned uh, the difference between officer and enlisted ranks. Okay. Uh, you want to give us a little, the, the uh, distinction there. Okay, it's a it's a huge distinction. Uh, having started out enlisted, uh, I got a chance to uh, work with officers when I was in the Navy, and uh, I I got a chance to talk to them quite a bit and and find out what it was that they had to do to to either go to the academy or to go through ROTC or officer training school, and that was something that piqued my interest and. Uh, it was just something I wanted to do, and therefore I just said the commission is the way to go if I want to stay and serve, and that's exactly what I did. Well, tell us about your career. Now, uh, you were not promoted to colonel because of the affirmative action program <laughs> or the uh, African American. There are certain things that you had to do uh, compete along with everyone else, right? Oh, no, no doubt. Uh, I, I laugh because, uh, no, we don't have those kind of quota programs going on in the military, but the military leads the way in terms of uh, giving everybody an equal opportunity to advance. Mm-hmm. And uh, for me, you know, if you're an officer, you first have to be commissioned. You have to have a degree. Once you have that, it's like everything else. You compete at every level. And uh, from, I guess, uh, second lieutenant to captain was like four years. Mm -hmm. And then from captain to major might be another six to eight years. And Mm -hmm. then lieutenant colonel, you know, another four or five on top of that. And then colonel is a little bit harder. And uh, as you go up, it's almost like a pyramid. It's only so much room at the top. So, mm-hmm. um, of course, colonel is not the top. Uh, there are generals above colonels, way above colonels. So, uh, but that's that's kind of how it goes in terms of that pecking order. Now you didn't want to wait that long, then, right? <laughs> it's not a matter of wait. It's a matter of being competitive. Um, and I guess along the way, I I, I had mentors that, that kind of helped me yeah. and, and told me, you know, this is what you need to do at this point. Uh, it's okay while you're a company grade officer, a captain, but once you become a field grade officer and major, everything kind of changes because there, there are more expectations in terms of what they expect you to do and what they want you to do. And you are really a leader from that point on because that's the way it works. And it just continues to go up in in terms of responsibility, in terms of what you have to do to command and get to the next level. I know you've had many uh, challenging experiences, but you want to tell us just a few challenging experiences uh, that you've had uh, uh, in the... um uh, and, and, and also how you confronted those challenges. Okay. Uh, now, when you say challenges, I, I, I can only think of one major challenge that, that, you know, that comes to mind to me, and that was being at the Pentagon during 9-11. Oh. And short, short of that, <laughs> nothing else comes close because it, it was one of those things. Nobody could script it or tell you uh, this is what you do when you find yourself in a situation, um, especially being in as long as I'd been in, you find out training becomes more important because you don't just do things. You react a certain way because of your training. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was probably the biggest, I guess, challenge that I had. Not that, uh, you know, I didn't know what to do or anything because uh, when that whole incident happened, uh, we were in front of a TV, you know, once our um, our boss, Colonel Reheiser, said, hey, you know, I think something major's happened. We need to get around the TV to kind of see what's going on. And uh, that was when, you know, our eyes all opened wide when we saw a second plane go through. Uh, and it was like, did that just happen? And uh, Glenn, I'll never forget uh, another Air Force colleague logistic type like I was said 
wow, if that just happened, you know, we're a target and uh, we're next. And 30 minutes later, he was right. <laughs> we were next. Wow. And that everyone was uh, uh, encouraged then to go to the bottom of the uh, building? Well, not so much encouraged. We had to stay <laughs> at our post and do our job. And oh. uh, our boss said, hey, if it gets that bad, they know where we are. They'll come and get us because, you know, on TV, you see a lot of people running out of the Pentagon. Yeah. But I can tell you, there were a lot of us that, that stayed around and didn't have that choice. Not so much choice because you had to do your job. And, uh, you know, uh, was there fear? Uh, fear didn't even sink in because the adrenaline kicked in. You knew what you had to do and you did your job. And yeah. uh, my job that day ended up being almost 22, 23 hours mm. because it just got to be that way because you can't leave until you relieved. And uh, my relief came in early that morning. So uh, that was that was challenging. That is a memorable experience that you'll never forget. Right? Oh, I'll never forget that one. Uh, in fact, I still have dreams about it, but not in a bad way. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those that you were, yeah, I'm there, and I'm glad I got a chance to live through it because, uh, you know, uh, during that time, like I say, we were there, or I was there all that time. I did get a chance to go outside and to look at the Pentagon, it was like, how could that have happened? Yeah. But uh, I, I guarantee you, something like that won't happen to the Pentagon again. <laughs> right, right. Well, uh, a, a similar incident happened in 1941 in the Pearl Harbor okay. uh, incident. Now, there was uh, one young man, uh, I guess African Americans could only be a steward in, yes. in those days. Yes. And Doris Miller, uh, we call him Dory Miller. I guess his wife named him Doris Miller. She wanted a, a, a girl out of all the boys that she had. She called him Doris, but, but he, we, we know him as Dory Miller. Came from the bottom of the ship, right? He came up to the deck, and it's my understanding that he shot down several Japanese planes. Is that right? Exactly, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's that's, that's amazing because to... Uh, to accomplish something like that and and never being trained on it, but yeah. seeing it enough, he knew exactly what to do. And uh, rather than stand around and do nothing, uh, he decided to get involved. And uh, his involvement kind of helped that situation out, which at that time was probably uh, hopeless, to say the least, because they caught him all off guard. Yeah, yeah, but that won't happen again. That won't happen again either. <laughs> we say that, you know, jokingly in a sense, but uh, hopefully our training and, and our intelligence and everything else will, uh, you know, alert us. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we have to be able to read and, and know exactly what's going on before it happens instead of after it's, it happens, because after it happens, it's too late. You want to talk about another... Um um, uh, historical, um, experience. And that's what your, your wife, your wife, uh, is, uh, is his, is the history as far as air, women in air force, right? Correct. Uh, my wife is a air force chaplain. Uh, she was one of the first female black, uh, or African American chaplains to go into the air force on active duty. And uh, she did that 1979, 1980. Uh, she came on active duty uh, after fi finishing seminary, uh, University of Rochester. And um, yeah, history to say the least. Um, <clears throat> now, she is one of the first or the first? Uh... She is the first African American female. Okay. Chaplain. Okay. <laughs> right. In the Air Force. <laughs> that is really something. Yes. And you uh, have a longevity of how many years? Uh, married uh, yeah, over right. 26 years. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> but tell us about um, uh, strategic planning uh, in, the, in the Air Force. You have to have strategic planning because they tell me 
if you fail to plan, then you plan to fail, right? Exactly. But the strategic planning that you have to be involved in. Uh, for me, I got a chance to see it up close and personal when I was at the Pentagon because there we worked for the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Yeah. And uh, me being in the logistics directorate, uh, we got a chance to see everything that was going on um, in all the services. So uh, logistics being, um, I guess, another way of looking at it is being the supply chain for all of the military. And uh, we can't fly and fight if we don't have the supplies to mm -hmm. do what we need to do. Mm -hmm. So in order to do that, everything we do, uh, we look at it in terms of from a strategic standpoint, we look at it in terms of being uh, two years, five years, 10 years. Mm -hmm. And at each one of those points, we go back once we hit the two year point to see where we are and see if we hit all of our um, points we needed to hit mm -hmm. and make. And if we didn't, we go back, we correct, we adjust and we move on and we get to the next point at five years, we take a look at it again. Mm -hmm. And each one of those all the way up to the 10 year point, we go, we look at what we need to do to be able to get that much further. But we have plans and those plans are always on the shelf, ready to pull down and they are updated as needed anywhere in the world where we need to go to be able to operate. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Well, uh, uh, since we talked about history, tell us about the uh, the role of the Tuskegee Airmen. Uh, Tuskegee Airmen, I guess, uh, for those that might not know a lot about it, it was, uh, uh, I guess, our way of being able to uh, become a part of that whole fly and fight mentality because uh, when we started out, uh, we didn't always have the Air Force. It was all the Army at that time, and it was mm. the Army Air Corps okay. because that's where the flying portion of it started. So uh, for the Air Force, it didn't start until 1947. It became a separate service. Mm -hmm. And during that time, um, if we go back and look at who were some of the trailblazers, at least on the African-American side, uh, one of the first is Benjamin O. Davis, Jr., not okay. senior, okay. junior. <laughs> okay, I understand, because the senior was the first African-American uh, brigadier. brigadier general. Yes, yes, he was. Mm -hmm. And uh, his son went to the Army Academy. He was in the class, if memory serves me right, 1932 was his graduating class. Mm -hmm. And... Um, when he came out, his first job was, uh, for the most part, if you're in the Army, everybody starts in the infantry and right. it goes from there. So right. that's where he started. But he wanted to fly. And uh, he came along just as the Tuskegee program was starting up. And uh, one of the biggest backers of the Tuskegee Airmen was Eleanor Roosevelt. And uh, she, you know course being married to her husband president roosevelt okay. uh talked to him along the lines of making sure the services were um desegregated mm -hmm. and uh her influence in that and that whole program that was started in tuskegee to see if we could fly <laughs> and come to find out we fly just like everybody else okay and uh that program produced a lot of uh Army pilots at that time that later became Air Force pilots. It, history is still being written because there are still some of those Tuskegee Airmen that are still alive around Chicago, believe yeah. it or not. Yeah, I went to one of the uh, 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 functions they had uh, south of Chicago. I believe your wife was uh, yes. was uh, instrumental in, in, in getting a group to go down. Right. But like you say, they're in a boy. 80s or 90 years old now. Oh, they, they're all in their 90s <laughs> if they're still alive. But, uh, yes, and and they all have stories to tell because uh, some of them, uh, I tell you, they, they went through a lot. It took a while for them to be able to become a part of that. And and once they got the opportunity to show what they uh, what their training had done for them, uh, they, they flew and they fought courageously. 
Well, let's get, let's uh, talk about a couple more uh, names that are in history. What about Daniel Chappie James Jr.? Okay, Daniel Chappie James Jr. Uh, was the first African American four star general in the Air Force, and okay. uh, he received his four star in 1975, and. Uh, I think it was 1978 that he passed away. So shortly after being promoted to uh, general, uh, he passed away in 1978. Okay, uh, that was uh, Chappie James, and uh, uh, who, I have a I have a Daniel. That's James right, his son. Third. That's right. He his son uh, Daniel Chappie James the uh, third, also an Air Force pilot um in fact he was born at tuskegee so that tells oh, you a lot <laughs> right, in terms right. of uh where he was born because his father probably trained not probably he did train at tuskegee during that whole program of training a lot of african-american pilots and uh daniel chappie james the third um was a three-star general uh. and he was a uh i guess the National Guard commander, director of the National Guard, which includes the Army National Guard and the Air National Guard, which is a flying wing. Um, so he was the director of that, and President Bush appointed him to that position. But he's no longer with us as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, he mm -hmm. passed away. It's my understanding, uh, you may correct me on this, that the uh, the First, let's see, the Tuskegee Airmen flew as escorts. That's right. In the, in the World, World War II. Exactly. But they were fighter escorts. That's the difference because fighters during that time had to always escort the bombers to where they needed to go. And they were escorts because they always had to be concerned about the German pilots coming in trying to disrupt you know, uh, the bombing missions. So that's what they were there for. And mm -hmm. uh, the Tuskegee Airmen were famous for being able to uh, protect those bombers all the way to their bombing mission and to return. So something that, you know, a lot of them, they took you to the fight, but they didn't take you all the way and they didn't make sure you got back. But uh, that was one of the things that a lot of the Tuskegee Airmen were famous for. Fantastic. Well, uh, wh while, while we're discussing Great Lakes, I retired from Great Lakes as a civilian employee. And uh, and I found out that there was uh, the first African-American officers that were tested. They were called the Golden 13. And there, speaking of barracks, there are some barracks well, not only barracks, I would say it was uh, the in, all the incoming naval personnel, female or male, have to come through. And that's on uh, 137. Uh, mm. they, they, they have to come through the, the Golden 13. Now, what's significant about the Golden 13 is that they made the highest scores in the Navy. Uh, and, and, for and officers. For officers. Right. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, uh, the establishment couldn't believe it. They retested them. And the second time, they made higher scores than they did the first time, you know. And uh, so that's the, the history there at the Golden 13. Of course, there's the Dora Miller uh, barracks there, too. Uh, and, um, and I think it's across the street from uh, McDonald's uh, on, on, on the base there. Okay. Well, we have uh, we have uh, Colonel, ladies and gentlemen, we have Colonel uh, Roy Merrill's uh, career, and uh, which included uh, a career at uh, at uh, the Air Force, and we talked a little bit about the the Great Lakes Naval Base since we we're right uh, right next door there. So I want to thank you, uh, 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 Colonel Merrill, for taking time again, and thank your wife for her uh, accomplishments uh, in the. And the uh, by being the first African American female chaplain, right in the Air Force. There you go. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for listening to another session on Community Focus. Remember, yesterday is gone. 
Today is a gift. We call it the present. Tomorrow may never be. This has been Community Focus. My name is Dr. Waddell Brooks, Sr., your host.